<clears throat> Usually, I'd tell a children's story, but it's too hot. So I'm going to tell you a little story, just a little one, and you children, big ones as well, you can snuggle up to your mums and dads. And that way, no one's going to be embarrassed, no one's going to be unsettled, and we're not going to make a disturbance within the church. Michael was a, a wonderful man. He loved God, he studied the Bible, and his faith became so intense. He only had one problem. When he came to church, he looked at the people and he saw what they were all doing wrong. And he thought to himself, how can I go to that church and still be a Christian? Well, you'd be surprised. He made a decision. He decided that he wasn't going to go to that church anymore and he went to five other churches and each one he looked at the people and everyone was doing something wrong. And I've got two beautiful boys down the front who are doing something right and that's really good to see. And Michael would have looked at these two boys and said, I'm going to see, keep coming to this church. But no, he looked at everyone else. And they were doing things wrong. So sadly, he decided from next Sabbath onwards, he would stay at home by himself, read his Bible, study and pray all day for the rest of his life by himself. And he did. He stayed at home. And that Sabbath, I've got to be honest, it was the longest Sabbath he'd ever had. He'd never had such a long Sabbath. And he thinks, what's missing? What am I doing wrong? But next Sabbath after, same thing. Stayed at home, woke up this time at 5.30 in the morning. He couldn't wait to Sabbath to close. 7.15 it closed. And he couldn't do anything that he wanted until after 7.15. And he thought, this, this worshipping by yourself's got real problems. Next Sabbath, he did the same thing again. But this time in the afternoon, a pastor came out. And the pastor sat with him and didn't say much, but Michael told the pastor all the reasons why he wasn't going to go to church. Now, I didn't add that this was the middle of uh, a cold spell. And they were sitting outside around a fire, and it was a big fire. And Michael listened to what the pastor had to say for about 20 minutes. And he's going, no, 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 no. You know how when you don't want to be convicted? Nothing the pastor said would change his mind at all. And the pastor, in his wisdom, said a silent prayer to God. Please, Lord, show me what to do. And suddenly an idea came to him. He got the tongs. He picked out one fiery coal and he put it to the side. He didn't say a word. Michael and the pastor looked at the coal and after five minutes, what do you think happened to the fire in the coal? It went out, didn't it? And the pastor didn't say anything. He just pointed to the fire and where all the coals were joined together, coming together, the fire was still burning. Michael got the lesson. Next week, he was back at church because the coal of the Holy Spirit had been lit in his heart. Brethren and sisters, if you're ever tempted to go and take time off church, please, you can't take time off God. This, this quarter's lessons are all about that and they are a fantastic quarter of lessons because they're saying, as Christians, we need to be together. 
We need to study together. We need to share with one another the beautiful things that we find. Oh, brothers and sisters, that's the end of that story. (laughs) But does that have a message for you? Have you been tempted to take time off? I'm telling you now, unless you continue meeting with fellow believers, your flame will go out. After I was baptised in this church on the 6th of June, six years ago, and who's counting, Terry? (laughs) I was told to watch out. I'd just been baptised. I walked out there and the minister shook my hand and a wonderful darling parishioner told me, watch out. Being concerned, I said, "Uh, what have I got to watch out for? I was told seriously, within 12 months, you will have lost all your enthusiasm for God. You will be back where you were before you even found out about God. Well, I'm not going to tell you who it was, but to that person, I'm still here. And my faith in God is stronger today than it was when I was baptised. And you might ask how that happened. Did it happen because when someone criticised me in church, I started going to another church? Or when someone told me off for doing something I wasn't supposed to, I went to another church? Or when someone said that my shirt was wrong, I went to another church? Or when someone told me that in the dining room I shouldn't do it that way, I went to another church? No, because it didn't matter what anyone said to me. I loved God. And I knew that when I loved God, people would have a go at me, because that's what the Bible says. So, if you've had a go at anyone, have you ever apologised? An interesting fight. You know, Jesus is coming. And there's two questions I ask, or two things I'd like to look at. Why we lose our first love, that's pretty important to know that, isn't it? And I think I've given you a few clues already. And just as importantly, how do we regain our first love? According to what God says in the Bible, the majority of those claiming to be Christians will lose their first love. That's a shocking thought, isn't it? You will lose your first love. Let's turn to Revelations, chapter 3. Now, you should all have a piece of paper with the text on it if you can't hear me. Revelation, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Revelation, chapter 3, Verses 16 and 17. So then, verse 16, So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, and listen to this, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? Well, I know I've got glasses on, but I'm not blind. So what's this saying? I'm poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked. I'm dressed, aren't I? What's this talking about? It's talking, brethren and sisters, about our spiritual condition. If we don't have God's robe of righteousness, then we are not going to be alive for Christ. It's a bit of a shock when we realise that these texts are are referring to me. 
When I heard them six years ago, I went, what? And I realised that what that person had said to me at the door in that foyer was true. If I didn't keep my eyes on God, I would be, as it said here, miserable, blind, poor and naked. But if I kept my eyes on God, if I kept coming to church regularly, if I kept studying regularly, if I studied his word every day, if I went to my knees daily and as many times a day as was necessary, I would not lose my faith. What is the answer? Well, what was the first song? Turn your eyes upon who? Jesus. That's why we had that song. Because that is the answer. We have to turn our eyes on Jesus. He is our greatest need. Only keeping our eyes on Jesus and what he has to say will lead us to revival. Because remember, we are poor, wretched, naked and blind. The greatest need of the world today, the greatest need you have today, the greatest need each one of you sitting here has today, including me, is revival, is Jesus. The world has reached a point of such degraded immorality that it is ripe for God's judgments. When we look back in Bible history, we see that every problem was caused by taking their eyes off Jesus and it always ended in destruction. Think of Noah, think of Sodom and Gomorrah, think of us. Every nation and people that has followed this path has ended up being destroyed. Sad to say that we as Christians are being sidetracked, sidetracked by an easy life. And you're not going to like what I'm going to read next. We're going to be sidetracked by the television, by money, by sport, by our clothing, by the makeup we wear, by the jewellery we have, by the hairstyles that we spend so long on. And sadly, the list goes on and on. Each one of those things is mentioned in the Bible. It's not me saying it, please. We're being distracted by what is happening now and we're worried about COVID, aren't we? And we're discussing this and other catastrophes rather than what? Rather than talking about God, our Saviour. That's what we should be talking about, brethren and sisters. He's promised so what about COVID? I will care for you. Keep your eyes on me. You know, Satan is wonderful. He creates in our hearts fear, fear of COVID. And I've heard many people say, oh, we can't cuddle one another, we can't do this, we can't do that. And why are they saying that? It's because of fear. And fear is put in your hearts by Satan. And did you know what? If you have fear, you are opening the door for Satan to come in and you're kicking God out. We're often willing to spend more time out on a meal than we do in an offering. We spend more time, more money on Christmas presents and birthday presents than we give to God. We're more worried about our hair. I mean, I really am. Unless, of course, we're Britain's, Great Britain's Prime Minister. He doesn't seem to worry about his hair at all. Uh, do our shoes match? Have I got the right tie, the right shirt, etc.? Am I colour coordinated? These are the sort of questions that distract us from God. When we watch TV, the news is rarely good. And sexual preference is being pushed at every opportunity. In fact, sexual deviant ideas are being pushed and promoted by the presenters on TV more than God's way. That's disgusting. 
Even the very words that we use are being perverted. For example, I used to say when I was being brought up, how did you go at the party? I'd say, I had a gay time. Now, what would people think? I look at the rainbow and I say, what a beautiful promise from God. Now, when you travel through Tasmania and you see the rainbow, you know that it's where homosexuals are welcome to stay. It even affects what allowed we're allowed to say and to write. I believe that the world now is in a worse state than it was in the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. The world is heading for destruction. Even the scientists today give us 25 years at worst and 50 years at best before we destroy the world. Men's hearts are failing them from fear. People are buying four-wheel drives so they can escape in the time of trouble. What about trusting God? God said in the time of trouble, he what? He will protect us and he will provide. Let's have a look at Daniel chapter 2. Jan Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Verses 44 and 45. Daniel chapter 2. Verses 44 and 45. Verse 44 says, And the days of these kings shall in the God of heaven set up a kingdom which what shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all all those kingdoms and it shall stand for how long? Forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain, verse 45, without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. Here we're talking about Daniel interpreting the dream. You know the dream of the great image? Who was the head of gold? Nebuchadnezzar. And it goes down, and I think I can nearly get it right. Gold, silver, who was that? Greece, brass, Medo Persia, iron, and iron and clay, the toes, the ten kingdoms, and then this is where this story comes in a great stone, hewn without hands, comes and shatters it all, destroys it all. The world is heading for destruction, isn't it? Rest assured, that's what the scientists are saying as well. The events taking place in our world today call for God to intervene. Man's trying to without success. Fire, floods, droughts, heat waves, tornadoes, cyclones, earthquakes, tsunamis, famines, wars, gender confusion, slavery, murder. You can keep adding to the list. These are all happening, aren't they? And they're happening like has never been seen before. Just this last week, we had a heat wave. People say, well, so what? But the people that have recorded temperatures ever since temperatures started being recorded say that this is the longest and the hottest heat wave that Perth has ever had. People of the world, you say, yeah, boy, it's hot. As Christians, we should be saying, that is a sign that Jesus is coming. We have COVID happening. 
And it's, it's putting a lot of people under pressure. And we're told that there will be pestilences. But this is just a touch of it. Believe you me. When the pestilence really happens, you will know the difference. But, and I have to say this, it's giving us an idea of something of what it will be like. We have people over in the east that can't sing in their churches still because they might contaminate one another. We have people over east, I don't think they've even been to church for nearly two years because of the COVID. So how easy is it going to be with all these laws already in, for our own good, by the way, how easy is it going to be to implement it one step further? Brethren and sisters, we are near the end of time. Don't ever doubt, doubt that earth's events will happen and they will happen soon. Turn to Psalms 119, verse 126. Psalms 119 and verse 126. This is David. Luke, could you read that out for me, please? Psalms 119, verse 126. Yes, please. Sorry, I put him on the spot. <laughs> Psalm 119, verse 126. Yeah. Lord, it is time for you to do something because your people have done wrong things. My version says, Help me, O Lord my God. O save me according to your mercy. What a wonderful God we have. You know, even back then, David was calling out for help, wasn't he? And that's what we need to be doing. Don't ever doubt that Earth's final events will happen soon. He wants to bring us and others into a saving relationship with Jesus. God will act to bring an end to sin in this world, which will happen when Jesus returns. Before this happens, there must be a great revival preparing us, God's people, into having a saving relationship with him. Ellen White said, Selected Messages, book, book 1, page 121, A revival of true godliness amongst us is the greatest and most urgent need of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. What is she saying? We need revival. Let's turn to Acts chapter 2. Verses 1 to 11. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. It's a long reading. I'll try not to interrupt myself. <laughs> and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord, where? In one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushy mind, rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Last week I talked about how we can misunderstand things Sadly, that particular text has been misunderstood by many, many people. But let's read on and find the full explanation. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews who were devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak what? in his own language. 
And they were all amazed and marvelled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these that, 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 that only speak Galilean? And how hear we, every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and dwellers in Mesopotamia, and Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontius, and Asia, verse 10, Phrasia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in parts of Libya and Cyrene and strangers of Rome and Jews and proselytes. In verse 11, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak what? In our own tongue. That's very clear, isn't it? But what's equally clear? This happened because they were blessed by the Holy Spirit. I want you to hold that thought. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 47. Verse 41 to 47. It's just on the same page for most of you. One page over if it's not. Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 47. Then they that gladly received his word were baptised, and the same day there were added unto them 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and men, many wonders and souls were done. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. Already we're given a good reason to meet together, aren't we? Verse 45, And sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, and every man who had a need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favour with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as would be saved. You know, you might be sitting in this church today, but that doesn't mean you're part of this church. Unless you are experience a revival, you can't be added to God's church. So I'm asking today, I'm pleading today for you to ask to be part of God's church. Isn't it wonderful to see that when this revival took place, people were filled with sadness, is that right? No. They were filled with joy. They loved one another and they wanted to share this love every day. They couldn't stop talking about the love of Jesus they had one purpose in life and that was to share, to tell their love for Jesus with one another and with others. As a result of them sharing their faith, what did Pastor Max take a sermon on the other day? On being ambassadors for God. As a result of being an ambassador for God and sharing their faith, every day the Lord added to the church. Are you honestly happy with the way things are going? Or are you worried and fearful? If you are, we need to realise that revival does not occur because of something I do or something you do or something we do as Christians. Notice I said it's not because of something we do. Revival is the result of Jesus working in you. There are things, however, that we need to do. That was the milk, Jesus living in you. However, there is meat. There are things that we need to do if we really want revival to take place. There is an absolutely inseparable relationship between revival and the Holy Spirit. We've already had two attacks on this church 
where people have tried to proselytise that there is no Holy Spirit. That's a direct attack on what the Bible is saying. We need the Holy Spirit. There is a Holy Spirit. Don't ever doubt that, brothers and sisters. Ellen White, Selected Messages, page, a book two, page 57. The baptism of the Holy Ghost as on the day of Pentecost will lead to a revival of true religion and the performance of many wonderful works. Notice it's saying, turn to the Bible. We don't need all rules and regulations on how to do things. They're man-made rules, man-made regulations. You know, if I had a portable mic, I'm telling you now, I'd be standing down there so I'm closer to you, so you could hear me without a microphone. But tradition says I've got to stand here because we have a fixed microphone. But the revival of true religion, Ellen White, comes a result of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Started off by reading in Revelation that we are lukewarm. That's every single one of us, so don't think you're better than anyone else. The baptism of the Holy Spirit spiritually revives the lukewarm Christian and gives them the power to witness for Christ. You know, if you're afraid to be telling other people about Jesus, if you're afraid to be an ambassador, then you need to pray earnestly for the Holy Spirit to lead you, to give you the power, to give you the strength. Jesus certainly knew the importance of what would happen when the Holy Spirit would be poured out in the early rain power at the day of Pentecost. Speaking of this, he said in Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, please. Luke chapter 12 and verse 49. Luke chapter 12 and verse 49. I am come to send fire on the earth and what will I if it be already kindled? What fire was Jesus talking of here? Of course, he was speaking of the fire of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we read earlier that the fire came on them like cloven tongues of fire. The fire of the Holy Spirit. This while we're in Luke, let's go back to Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Please remember, brothers and sisters, this is not me speaking. This is the Holy Spirit leading us through the Bible, which was inspired by God. Luke chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that what? Whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't that what we want? Oh, I've got the wrong one. That was helpful in any case, see? Luke 3.16, we'll go there now. Matthew, Mark, Luke. <laughs> wonder why someone was shaking their head. Luke 3.16. Isn't it wonderful that you were looking it up? <laughs> you can see the power of not just taking what you hear, but checking it for yourself. Luke 3. Have I got it right this time? Luke 3, verse 16. John answered, saying unto them, I indeed baptise you with water, but one mightier than I cometh the latchet of whose shoes am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptise you with the what? Holy Ghost and with fire. A lot of people don't realise Jesus didn't start his ministry until after his baptism he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. 
which came on him like a holy dove. The apostles didn't start their work until they were gathered together at Pentecost and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon each of them by tongues of fire. Sometimes I'd like to suggest we try to do things on our own strength. We ask God, but we forget to ask for the Holy Spirit. So we need to ask God the Father to send us the Holy Spirit and we need to ask in the name of Jesus. Luke 3.16, we've just read it. How do we, sinful as we are, receive the Holy Spirit and experience revival? The same way believers always have, by prayerfully claiming God's promises. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was received by the early church on the day of Pentecost as a result of them praying together for 10 days claiming God's promises. Let's go to Acts, Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. They all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. What were they doing? They were praying. They were seeking God, weren't they? And that's what was important. They were all together of one accord. They didn't have someone saying, coming to you and saying, man never went to the moon. That's a conspiracy theory. They didn't come to one another with any conspiracy theories. They came to one another with the word of God. And if someone comes to you today or tomorrow with, oh, look, have you heard this? The king of the north is. Be cautious. Find out what the Bible says. Because even the very elect have been led astray by false claims and by false interpretations of the Bible. Acts 1.14 says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. And notice, including the women, with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. They all came together. What a beautiful thought. Ellen White, Selected Messages, Book 1, page 121, writes, A revival needs to only need to be expected in answer to prayer. I want to repeat that. A revival need only be expected in answer to prayer. We all need to pray the prayer of David in Psalms 85, 6. We won't look it up. But wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? That was Psalms 85, 6. I've got to tell you, brethren and sisters, we're hearing about coming together of one accord, aren't we? We're hearing about coming together daily. You might be surprised to know this church has six prayer meetings a week. We have six at 9.30, uh, five at 9.30 in the morning, Monday to Friday, and we have one at 7 o'clock on a Wednesday night. I'm not saying come to all of them, brethren and sisters, but I'm inviting you, if you are in town, why not come and share in the prayer time with the church? It's sad when we see how many people, because of distance, because of other reasons, don't, can't or won't 
attend prayer meetings, won't meet daily. If you can't get to these prayer meetings, then meet as a small group, please. It's absolutely vital. Doing it by yourself isn't sufficient. You need to be praying with others. What does the Lord say? Where two or three are gathered in my name. That's what we're doing. So I invite any one of you, if you're impressed, to please come along to the prayer meetings. To please study your lesson daily. To please come to Sabbath school. You know, Ellen White says that the Sabbath school is the engine of the church. Sabbath school is the engine of the church. Here you're only listening. When you come to Sabbath school, you are giving, you are hearing, you are sharing, you are of one accord, you are united in your love for God. So I invite each one of you to make a decision I'm going to pray about that right now. Oh Lord, I just feel moved to pray, to ask everyone here to be impressed by the Holy Spirit, to start anew their relationship with you, to study their lesson daily, to meet with you daily, and Lord, to be here each Sabbath on time for the lesson study. Oh Lord, please, please, please be, be with your people. They love you, Lord, but we're all lukewarm. So fill the people with love and desire to please you. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Revival is not reserved only for the Christian church. In Second Chronicles, we read a description, a very clear description of how revival takes place amongst God's people. Let's have a look at Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14. <clears throat> I have a terrible memory, and when I was looking this up the other day, again, I couldn't find it, because I was looking in the New Testament, not the Old Testament. Okay, Second Chronicles. Chapter 7, just before Psalms it is, Second Chronicles, chapter 7 and verse 14. I've got the wrong verse, I apologise. The one I should have, if my people... Okay, I apologise, people. Um, would someone read it, please? If my people... Yeah. I will hear from heaven and I will what? Forgive their sins. Satan's giving, making it hard for me. Just a moment, people. God is always ready to pour out his spirit, but revival requires 100% surrender to God on your part. You might think some of the things I've said today are hard, but you have to surrender yourself 100% to God. This is why in God's message to us, he counsels us, to buy of him. Let's have a look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. 
that I saw mentioned there is the Holy Spirit. Anoint your eyes with the Holy Spirit. We buy by giving ourselves unreservedly to God. There may be financial wrongs that we've done, that we've righted, but we have to make them right today. Tomorrow is too late. Christ is coming soon. There may be apologies to be given. We may think we've apologised, but we're still hanging on to it. We're still remembering that terrible thing that person did to us. Or we've done a said a terrible thing to someone and for some reason it slipped our mind and we've never asked for forgiveness. We've never apologised. Brethren and sisters, amongst us there are people that have that problem. But we want to be of one accord, don't we? We need to come to God. We need to ask him to come into our heart. We need to ask him to convict us of what we need to make right so that we can be ready for heaven. If you want to make the devil tremble, begin earnestly to seek God in prayer for revival. Brethren and sisters, are you willing to surrender all to God by giving him 100% of yourself? That's what it will take to experience true revival in your life, to be ready and to take part in that revival that is nearly here. Do you want to be part of this revival or the things of this world so attractive that you are willing to hear the words, depart from me, you have been judged and I know you not. Our last hymn is number 495. After we sing this hymn, I invite you to, if you feel so inclined, just to reverently bow your head and give your heart to Jesus. I ask the others, when you're finished or ready, just to leave quietly and the elders will shake your hands at the door. Thank you so much for coming. But remember, this is the house of the Lord and I ask you to leave reverently. Thank you.
united in love for you. Lord, we ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on each one of us so that we can be ready for when you come. Lord, empty our hearts of any sin that we haven't asked for forgiveness for. Help us, Lord, to be right with you. Lord, Father in heaven, we pray that you will give us the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will bring us Jesus so that our righteousness will be Jesus in us so that when you look at us you will see Jesus righteousness I ask this in Jesus precious holy name Amen Thank you